Recording. <clears throat> hey guys, it's Megan Moore from thebeautystoop.com. Thanks so much for clicking on this video. I am super excited, which I say at the beginning of every video, so just get used to it now. Um, today we are doing a Q&A. You guys sent me your Q, your cues, your cues, your questions on Instagram. I'm going to answer them. Some of them are beauty related. Most of them are beauty related, and a few are personal questions. Um, just you know, splash it in there in case you want to know a little bit more about moi. So, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Let's jump right in. Okay, first question is a skincare question. It's from Lisa Bosch. She says, do you have a favorite retinol pro product? I've never used any, but I would like to try it out. So retinol is the number one proven ingredient for anti-aging. It's going to help your cells turn over faster. It's going to thin the skin out slightly, which scares a lot of people. But if you think about it and you've got a big deep wrinkle, but then you kind of take that surface layer off, it's going to make that wrinkle more shallow, right? So it's actually a really cool thing. I grabbed two of my favorite retinol products. <clears throat> And they are quite different on the price point, um, but they both are amazing. So this is the Sunday Riley Luna Sleeping Oil. Um, you sleep in this one and it's going to help reduce the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles. It's going to, like I said, turn over the cells. It has essential oils in it. And this is a high-end, definitely expensive product. This one is by The Ordinary, which is a super affordable skincare brand out of the UK. And... Um, this is just their advanced retinoid 2% serum. So you can use this day or night, splash it on your face, and it's awesome, again, for a really great price point. So if you want to try a retinol, a retinoid, um, but you don't want to get a prescription option, then these are both great ones, and I will make sure you have all this information down below. Yeah. All right, let's see. Who is next? <clears throat> Who is the rudest makeup blogger? famous slash Instagram person that you have ever met. This is by Marin Stone. I don't want to like name names because I don't want to do that. But I think my opinion on blogging and the Instagram world is that it kind of it kind of reverts people back into like high school comparison and um, insecurity, which is the one thing I really hate about it. And yeah, I, I get insecure. I don't have as many followers as I would like, and I get frustrated with that, but I'm also not willing to like do certain things to get followers. So I don't know. Sometimes when you meet them in real life, like at these blogger events, you go back to that like high school insecurity, and people are um, not always the nicest. And I think a lot of it's because they're feeling judged themselves, and so they like put off that protective barrier and kind of put on their like, resting bitch face because they just don't want to be embarrassed or hurt themselves and I've seen that happen. I'm older when it comes to the blogging community in Utah. I'm 34 and a lot of the other bloggers around are in their 20s and so sometimes I just think they haven't quite hit the maturity level and say and do some dumb things. Like I said, I'm not going to call out names, but yes, it does happen. But the vast majority of famous people or Instagrammers or beauty bloggers that I've met have all been absolutely amazing and lovely humans. I've met Candy Johnson. She was, she's like the original, the OG, you know, YouTuber. She was amazing. I've met Michelle Phan. She was stunning and gorgeous and super amazing in real life. Um, so, I don't know. I haven't. I I've had a few instances where I was like, hmm, left a bad taste in my mouth. But I don't think it was intentional, and I try really hard to not be one of those people. So I hope that if you ever meet me out in the real world, you'll see that I'm just a normal, super dorky person. I am who I am on camera in real life too. So, okay, there's that. Um, let's see. What is your favorite natural remedy for pores around the nose? I don't know that it, natural, I don't know, that that gets thrown in there. I'm like, I don't know what exactly what you want as far as natural, but as far as the best product for pores and minimizing pores, I'm going to say I think it's charcoal. Um, I love charcoal scrubs and charcoal masks and charcoal whatever because it really dries up the oil and, and causes the pores to close down. My favorite charcoal product is the Dermalogica Daily Super Foliant. So this is actually a powder charcoal form. Ooh, man, now it's all over my floor. Um, and you mix it with water and it turns into like a grainy, bubbly, gray 
charcoal scrubber and you can use that on the nose and anywhere the pores are and it's going to just pull all of the grossness out and then shrink down those pores it tightens as well so your skin does feel a little bit tighter but if you're oily or have big pores I highly highly recommend this one there's some other great charcoal products out there but this one is my favorite next question let's see <clears throat> This is, oh, and that one was from Jay Sheriff. Okay, this is Call Hearts You. These Instagram handles are tricky. <laughs> um, please tell us how middle-aged women can keep under eye concealer from looking terrible. Is it even possible? Question mark. Yes, it's possible, but you need to be realistic about what concealer does. So, concealer cannot change the texture of your skin. All it can do is change the color. So I think a lot of people have ideas about what concealer is supposed to do that are far and beyond what technology has, has brought us. Concealer corrects color, but it cannot correct texture. So I can put it on a zit and make the zit look better, but will it make it flat and go away? No. The texture and the bump is still there. I can put it over fine lines and wrinkles to even out the color and give it some brightness so that the reflection is there and it doesn't look as deep and as harsh. But will it make a wrinkle go away? No. So be realistic about what your concealer is going to do. And then I think the biggest thing is using less concealer and using a color that's correct. If you feel like your concealer settles into your lines and accelerates them, exaggerates them, it's probably too light of a color. It needs to be closer to your skin tone. You know, we, we see a lot of people use these very, very light, bright concealers under their eyes for like, you know, contouring. But that, and that works if your skin is really smooth and young. But if you're dealing with wrinkles, contouring is no longer gonna be what you wanna go for. You wanna match your skin a titch lighter on the concealer, but nothing like the contouring concealers that we're used to seeing and use less of it. Just a tiny bit, of, tiny bit of it is going to lay on the skin better. And then prep the skin first. So a good under eye uh, lotion, eye cream, something to hydrate um, the skin first is crucial. So I love this under eye um, hydrating stick that's Korean. You get it at CVS. I will link to it down below. It's always cold, so it helps with the bags. This one's a new one to me, but I've been loving it, the Ule, Ula Hendrickson Banana Bright. Any kind of eye cream, something under the eye first before you put on your concealer. Let it soak in all the way and then conceal. But less is more and keep your color pretty close to the skin tone already. You're just trying to brighten and even it out, get rid of the dark circle, but you're never going to make wrinkles go away, so don't have that expectation because it's just going to let you down. Harsh, but true. Next question, what age is considered... Too old for glitter eyeshadow. This is from Cybane. Cy I, I can't, you know, whatever. I'm going to say 40. 40 is where I say the cutoff for glitter happens. Now, beyond 40, you can certainly still use shimmer and satin finishes, but glitter, like actual little chunks of glitter, need to go away. And it may even be before that if you're already dealing with lots of um, fine lines and wrinkles around the eyes, glitter is not going to be your friend. It will accentuate those and will also migrate into those lines and the creases and it's going to accelerate and accentuate them again. So it may be before 40 depending on you and your eyes and your skin, but definitely from 40 on glitter needs to go bye bye. This is from Beth Field. She says, I need eyeliner help. I stink at applying it. I hate how it looks on me because I feel like it closes off my eyes. What are some tips for keeping wide eyes with eyeliner? And what type of eyeliner is easiest to use if you seriously struggle drawing a straight line? Okay, well, Beth, if you've watched any of my story tutorials, you know that I very, very rarely wear eyeliner. The reason is, A, I don't think I'm very good at it either, but B, Eyeliner closes off your eyes and ages you up. If you're 20 and you want to look 30, then pile it on. It's going to make you look older. But if you're trying to look younger, eyeliner, in my opinion, does not do that for you. It closes down the eyes. It accentuates 
the fine lines and wrinkles around the eyes. I just, it's not flattering to me. So when people say I don't look good in it, then stop wearing it. I hardly ever wear it. On a very rare occasion I will, and usually it's only on the bottom. I very rarely wear it on the top because I think it closes my eyes off and I think it makes me look older. And I'm at an age now where I don't want to look older. And if I do wear it, it's usually brown. I don't like black because of those same things. It's harsh, it closes down the eyes, and it just, ugh. Sometimes I'll use it on the waterline underneath to like make my lash line look thicker, but as far as on top of the lid, I very rarely use it. And I am on a personal mission to kind of try to tell people to let it go. <laughs> let it go and just be your beautiful bright eyed self. Keep things light and bright, lots of mascara, curl the lashes to open them, and just kind of ditch the eyeliner. There's nothing wrong with it, but I think people are so used to it and they think that it's that it's just has to be part of your routine. It doesn't. So that's my answer. Let it go. Lisa Hansky or Hansky asks, what kind of facials do you recommend? Are any of them good or better than others? So I am a facial connoisseur. <laughs> I'd much rather have a facial over a massage any day, hands down, done. So let me tell you, there's two different really kinds of facials to consider. There are the relaxing, more pampering facials that are more similar to a massage type environment, right? Where you're in like a very relaxing zen type situation, kind of zen music, you're gonna have a really great relaxation process. And then there's more medical facials, which are going to be typically in a more of a med spa situation where the lights are brighter, um, it's, a, it's a more sanitary medical type situation because you're doing something that's a little bit more intense. These are going to be facials like a hydro facial, the vampire facial, um, things like chemical pills and all that are going to be more on the medical side. So there's two different kinds and for me there's two different kinds of places that I go for these like a med spa versus kind of a pamper spa. They're two kind of different things. Um, I love both. for they're great qualities for each, right? I love a great relaxation, a pamper session, that's something I'm gonna do um, for a splurge, for a birthday, when I just need like some me time. And then I love the more medical side too when I'm really trying to treat something like my acne or my fine lines or I'm really trying to be more aggressive about it. So they're both amazing. Um, so it depends on what your goals are. I love both and I try to mix them up and do one a month and I kind of switch back and forth depending on what I'm what I'm looking for. Um, so I hope that helps give you some guideline. Um, I would probably suggest just starting with a basic facial first so you can kind of get used to, you know, you're laying there, somebody else is touching your face, they're quite close to you, all of those things that you may have never experienced before. So that's a great way to get into it and then you can talk to that person because they may do both, right? They may do medical things too. Um, but you can kind of go and, and develop kind of a plan for your future and your face and what you want to achieve and then hopefully you have a great um, person that's behind you that wants to help you achieve those skin goals. So that is my A to that Q. Should I put foundation on my eyes and then a primer or just the primer? That's from Leslie Hayward and um, I also had another eye primer question. What's the best way to keep my makeup on, specifically my eyeshadow? I feel like my foundation stays all day, but my eyeshadow is gone by lunch, and that is Carter's Gal. So both of those two questions. Um, no, you definitely do not need foundation over your eyelids as well, but you, you can. You can put foundation over your eyelids. I would just recommend that you set the, the foundation with some sort of powder before you put on your eyeshadow if you're going to do that. Um, or you can do foundation, primer, and then eyeshadow. It's totally up to you. If you have an oily eyelid, I would suggest keeping the foundation off of it. Um, it seems to me that the more products you layer, the easier it is to have them kind of break down and fall apart. So I would stay clear of adding too much um, and less is more. I have some of my favorite eyelid primers here to help you get your makeup to stay longer. My top favorite is the Too Faced Shadow Insurance. Now this is the old packaging, the new packaging is blue, but it's the same product. This was my go-to. Um, this is another favorite, it's on the higher end side. This is the NARS um, Eye Shadow Primer, and this is great for oily eyelids, but quite expensive. 
If you don't have oily eyelids and you just want your eyeshadow to pop and show up a little bit more, this e.l.f. one actually, their eyelid primer is a great option just to give something for your eyeshadow to stick to to give you a little bit better performance. So I'll have these linked down below if that um, is something you're interested in. My question for you is a good pore minimizer for somebody over age 40. Um, so my favorite pore minimizer is the Hydra Blur by Dermalogica. It is quite pricey but a little goes a long way and I love it because it's kind of a hybrid between a silicone and a lotion primer. I just love the texture of it. It doesn't, doesn't leave me greasy um, and it really fills in the pores nicely and preps the face so well. A lower budget option is the NYX Pore Filler. I really like this one. Um, this one is going to lean more towards the silicone side and less lotion-y, um, but it is great as well. So this one is a, is a great option if you are needing a pore filler but you don't want to spend a ton of money. This one is really similar to the Benefit Pore Professional, which has a cult following, and it's a great product as well, don't get me wrong, but those are my two favorites for the high and the low end. Okay, we're going to end up end on one more personal question. This is not a makeup one. This is by Sarah Sage, and she says, Was there ever a time in your life where you didn't want kids? Only asking because right now I don't want any, and I just, and I wonder if that might change. The reason I picked this question to talk about is because it is a personal one to me, and I think it doesn't get talked about a lot. Yes, 100% there was a time in my life where I didn't want kids. I don't have the nurture gene very strong, like the, oh, I want to be a mother gene so strong, and it was always just like, I did want a family, like, in theory, but in reality, it was something that just didn't come naturally to me, and luckily, my husband is incredibly nurturing, and he was really supportive of me and, and waiting for the timing to be right, but he always had to be the one that was like, okay, Meg, like, let's really seriously think about this. It's time, you know, to start a family or to have another kid. And after our second child, I was, like, done. I was totally complete and, and ready to close that chapter of my life and didn't want any more children. And it was actually my husband that felt really strongly that there was one more child out there for us and that, that our family wasn't done yet. And I, I hate to say that, like, because he didn't coerce me or make me or anything. It's just I just I relied on him. I lent, I leaned on him and his desire to, to grow our family and his excitement about it because I needed that push from somewhere else. And anybody who has met me in the last year knows that that third baby has changed my life in a way I cannot describe and it makes me cry. And so yes, I think even if you don't feel like you want kids or or they they are not coming into your plan right now, when it does, it will it will happen and it happens in the timeline it's supposed to and you don't always get get it the way you want it, but when it happens it's amazing and for me, um, the nurture and mother gene came later and it's been an amazing change in my life and in my personality to to find that. So I hope that helps answer that question at all um, because my three kids are, you know, my joy, but they're also, it's also hard, like I'm not going to lie. So, you know, there's that, but I do love my kids. <laughs> all right, you guys, thanks for watching. If you have more um, questions, please send them to me. I love to answer your questions on DM, and if I didn't get to yours in this video, I will be sure to respond on Instagram. You never know which ones I'm going to pull up for these videos, so I will get back to you, and I will see you all in my next video soon. Bye.